Welcome to the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. These webinars are designed to provide you, Tennessee Promise students, with an opportunity to learn more about college success tips, careers in your potential field of study, and other topics we think you will find interesting while you are navigating your educational journey. These webinars will also help you complete your community service requirement while it may be difficult for you to do so at this time. A few housekeeping details before we get started. By logging in as a Tennessee Achieve student, we are able to track your attendance and how long you remain actively engaged during the webinar. Once you complete the webinar, you will automatically be given credit for one hour of community service. We will track how long you watch, and if you do not watch the webinar in its entirety, you will not receive credit. You do not need to complete the community service form for these webinars. Tennessee Achieves will log your hours for you. Tennessee Achieves staff and partners across the state are providing important insight and information we think you will find entertaining and informative. We hope you enjoy this new series of webinars. Welcome to the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar Series. Today we are discussing, discussing careers in healthcare. Um, when we survey Tennessee Promise students, there are two fields that seem to come up over and over again um, that students are really interested in, and that is healthcare and education. So today we're going to tackle one of our most popular um, field, fields of study, um, and that's healthcare. Uh, we have with us today David Tresh, who is the Director of People and Leadership Development at Murray Regional Health System. Kirby Campbell, who is a research scientist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and Kiami Coleman, who is an administrative medical assistant at DeVita. I want to welcome all three of you and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you. And Kiami, we'll talk about this at some point, but Kiami is a, a former Tennessee Promise student. So I think that'll be a really interesting to weave this into the conversation so students out there can hear from someone that was in their shoes not too long ago. But uh, why don't we just start out, if you guys will tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you're from, where you went to college, um, maybe some of you went to more than one college, um, degrees that you have earned, um, and a little bit about what you do now. David, you want to kick us off? Sure. Yeah, well, I live in Franklin, Tennessee, and I, I work down here, of course, for the uh, Murray Regional Health System. Uh, we have three different hospitals and a bunch of different physician offices spread out down here. Uh, my background, I, uh, I attended my undergraduate work at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, where I got my, uh, my undergraduate degree in sports medicine. And then I went on and did my uh, graduate work at Western Carolina University, where I got my master's degree there. Um, have worked a whole bunch of different uh, interesting, interesting positions over the years uh, that's led me to where I am now. And I had all of the uh, people development and uh, leadership development at Murray Regional. So I take uh, new leaders from the time they start and try to grow them and, and create succession plans for them and, and uh, just move people through our system. That's great. Thanks for that, David. Kiami, we'll keep it in Middle Tennessee. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I'm actually from Detroit, Michigan. I resided well, I actually moved here in 2011. I'm actually also a first time graduate of my in my family. Um, I actually have my degree, Associates of Science in Education, and now I've gone into healthcare. So I started in education, now I'm in healthcare. Um, with me, day to day, I'm actually like the behind the scenes, the brains behind the operation. Like you see the people that go to like dialysis, that do the blood. I'm like the person that's on the computer, putting in the information, doing the follow ups, the scheduling. I'm just like the the go to behind the scenes in the sense. Yeah, you're that person um, that nobody sees, but you're making it all happen, right? Right. All right. Well, Kirby, um, thanks for joining us today. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where you went to school, um, and what you do now? Yeah, definitely. So I'm originally from Kansas City. Go Chiefs! Got to shout that out. <laughs> uh, but I um, so I'm born and raised Kansas City. I then went just a couple hours east to the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, there in the middle of the state, uh, where I earned a bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering. Um, I also did a minor in business, so I kind of thought maybe I wanted to go into business in biomedical engineering, maybe start my own company. Um, but over the years, um, I slowly got drawn more into the research. I did a lot of undergraduate research uh, working on detecting melanoma in uh, circulating your blood so you can detect melanoma early and hopefully save lives that way. Um, 
And uh, that kind of got me really, really excited about doing research. And so you kind of have to be when you when you then enroll in a PhD for six years. Uh, but um, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I then went up north to the freezing cold Madison, Wisconsin, which Kiami, me, it sounds like you know what cold's like being from Detroit. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, I really enjoyed my time there working on, I was on a biomedical engineering program, PhD, where I worked in the kind of specialization of something called biophotonics. But that's just a fancy word of using light uh, for biological purposes. Uh, mainly, I was working on another diagnostic tool for ovarian cancer um, there, but um, where I also earned a master's degree in biomedical engineering along the way. Uh, but uh, but yeah, now now uh, after that PhD, I have the honor and privilege of of working for the great St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and it could not be a more fantastic place, um, especially for a research scientist. Um, they just they have it all together. I mean, they 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 have the best people, the brightest minds, the resources there, where everybody interacts and collaborates. Um, so it's just a dream dream job of mine. I have some history with the hospital going way back to even my grandfather being Lebanese, uh, being Danny Thomas's kind of friend. Uh, kind of, we, we were uh, involved in a lot of uh, fundraising in Kansas City for the hospital way back when my dad was even a baby, like a, a child. So um, I just have some deep roots and um, really, really excited to do research there where I'm in the Department of Neurobiology, Developmental Neurobiology. It's kind of a, a tongue twister, uh, but basically we're looking at um, neurons in the developing brain. Wow, that's uh, an extensive um, background there that I'm going to be honest with you. I have a communication degree. Um, I don't know all the things you said, but we're going to learn more about it today and mm -hmm. um, and provide some background for students that are interested in doing some careers like you guys do. David, um, I'm going to start a little bit. Um, I think one of the things I really like about this panel, um, and we can certainly talk about these things today, but I think when people think healthcare, they think doctors, they think nurses, um, they think the people that they see when they go to the hospital. Um, I know you've been involved in healthcare in a couple of different ways, but why did you decide to get into this field? What was exciting about this for you? Well, I think the the my background with it goes all the way back to where you know I had an, uh, I just had this natural love for maximizing the talents of others and really kind of developing and I love to watch people do things they didn't think they would do. So the first part of my career started out working with athletes and a lot of times it was elite athletes from Olympic athletes, professional athletes. And it was being able to figure out new ways to, if they would get hurt, help them to, to just really um, come back even stronger than they were before. And so now it's evolved as I've learned more and more about myself and what the parts of my job that I absolutely love more than others. So now it's me helping others help others. So it's really kind of that cascade effect. And that's really what leadership is all about. You know, when I talk about doing leadership development, one of the things I talk about is there's really only one qualification to be to be considered a leader, and that's you've got people who are willing to follow you. Anything other than that is, you know, just nice things to have. But, you know, so when we look at that and that's that's where that's where my passion is. That's why I, I just happen to choose healthcare uh, because there's a huge need in that. I mean, you know, it's uh, there's a huge need in being able to effectively communicate. Um, you know, one of the things that that I love most about my job is teaching others the arts of communication and healthcare is. I mean, it's one of the one of those one of the parts where that's needed is most. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right on point. I know that a lot of times when people are going to the doctor, you um, hear these terms you're unfamiliar with and you don't know what they mean. And being able to communicate communicate that to patients so that they really understand what's happening is certainly um, something that's very vital in your career, I would imagine. Um, yeah. Any famous athletes that we might know? And are, are you allowed to tell us that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I, I was actually selected to the 1980 Olympic summer team, but uh, we have the distinction of being the only Olympic team never to actually go to the Olympics from the United States. That's right. Um, everybody remembers the 80 uh, Miracle on Ice team, but the summer Olympics 
did not happen for the U.S. We boycotted those games. So our Olympic Games were the Olympic trials in Eugene, Oregon. So I got to work with a lot of elite runners, the Ronaldo Nehemiahs, the Alberto Salazars, uh, a lot of folks like that. Um, and then I went over and, and I worked in professional baseball for a number of years, uh, where, in fact, uh, I do have a world series ring. I was with the, with the world series championship team wow. in 1986 when we won, <laughs> won the world series against Boston. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, 96 games, I was on the planning and event, uh, side of that getting getting all the logistics for you know if someone got hurt kayaking we had to have a process involved of how how long will it take to get them out of the water extricated where a helicopter lands and can fly them down in our case it was emory uh emory university medical center uh so it was timing out all that stuff that was about a six month project there um I had a chance to work in professional hockey. In fact, actually, the coach of the uh, Columbus Blue Jackets is an old player of mine, uh, John Tortorella, who was a, a great player um, in his own right. So I've had a lot of opportunities to work with some really, really great athletes through the years. Very cool. I didn't know we had a World Series ring on the webinar. Yeah, so dude. I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's awesome. I was like, Kirby's excited too. Um, <laughs> oh, well, well, now Kirby, I did. Uh, <laughs> I, did, so cool. I, did I did a stint. I did a stint in Kansas City. I I worked over in Lenexa uh, for, for a few years over there with. Thermo oh yeah, it's really close where I was born. Yeah, Thermo Fisher Scientific. I worked for the them. Thermo Fisher. Yeah, I headed up their global microbiology training and development for for a few years. Very cool. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm from Overland Park originally, so right okay. next door. <laughs> yep, I lived up in Shawnee Mission. <laughs> That's great. It's it's funny how small the world can be sometimes. Um, <laughs> Tommy, let's go to you next. You talked about um, you originally thought you were going to go into education. What brought you to the healthcare field? Um, for me, my passion changed, and I like my career. I was in education, like my first and second year. While I was in school, I was in education, like towards the end. I was like, is this something you really want to do? And I had to come to that conclusion myself because I'm like, OK, I enjoy teaching kids. But then I enjoy helping people that are sickly because I have a lot of family members in my family that goes to dialysis. So I know like Davida a little bit like their background um, for me. It was just trying to be somewhere where I can. Just help others, because honestly, I'm still in between a little bit because I still do foster care work and I still do health care. But my main thing is health care. Um, I would just say I came to that revelation of I enjoy being that the go to face for everybody because they're like they see the doctors, they see the nurses, they see the people that draw their blood. But then it's like when they see me, they're like, OK, she's part of the operations team that keeps people employed, but also get them the help that they need as well. So I would definitely have to say just being the operation, being part of the operations made me spark an interest in healthcare. Yeah, I think we have a lot of students. I know I changed my major several times in college. A lot of students that maybe find themselves there, they want to change their major. They get going down a, a field that maybe it's not what they're passionate about once they get a little more experience. Was that scary for you? And what advice do you have for students that maybe find themselves in that situation? Um, at first, it was discouraging because I was so, I myself, I was trying to keep up with everybody else. Like my friends, uh, I have a great friend of mine that was at MTSU. He changed his major twice. He ended up going to WKU, changed his major there, came back to MTSU and changed his major. So I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not that bad. If I want to change mine just once. But you're going to get that feeling of, mm -hmm. OK, this might take a little longer than needed. But if that's your passion, no matter it's not a race, it's not a marathon, you can only keep up with yourself. So don't get tied up with trying to finish up in four years. It might take you five years. It might take you six years. As long as you love what you do, it'll never feel like you're going to work, because if that's what your passion is, it's going to happen. If you want to change it, change it. Because you don't want to get a degree in something that you're not happy with. You're in a situation that you're just not excited to do every day. So regardless of the time frame or how many years it takes you to get it, if you feel that you need to change it, change it. 
don't listen to anybody else. Don't let anybody discourage you or try to pull you away from what you want to do. Because at the end of the day, the degree is for you, no, not anyone else. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And I think we would probably all, okay, if you find something that you love to do, it does look like going to work every day. Kirby, uh, what about you? Tell us what, what spurred your interest in um, the healthcare field. And then I'm going to kind of ask you a two-part question. So what got you into healthcare? And then um, why is research important? Um, I, I remember having to take a research class in college and thinking like, oh man, I was dreading it. I'll never have to use it. Um, but I know that a, a lot of professions and lockers do require some type of research. So why is it important that students learn how to do that? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, first off, first part, what made me choose uh, my career in healthcare? So that dates me back to growing up. I have a, uh, my mother was always on the front lines of healthcare as an ER nurse in like a trauma center, uh, just, you know, not too far from her house. So she would come home with these just crazy stories that really always got me really interested in, you know, and potentially maybe becoming a doctor to, to, to you know, help out with, with those fronts. But um, as I progressed through college, um, I was I was on the pre-medicine track where I thought I was going to go to med school. And I did a lot of shadowing in the ER with her because when, when you're an ER nurse for 30 years, you become really good friends with a lot of doctors. So here I am in in, uh, in college, like freshman or sophomore year, and I'm shadowing these these surgeons. And um, I quickly found out that I wasn't the best around blood. <laughs> so I got very <laughs> squeamish, and uh, I think it's a very common thing. But um, it was one of those things that I had to kind of step back, uh, take a step back and reassess because I knew that maybe there's a chance I would get over my squeamishness for it. But uh, ultimately, it wasn't too much fun where I had to like, hey, doc, I got to take a break. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm going to pass out. <laughs> so um, so that's a really re uh, real and relatable problem, I think, for a lot of people. And um, that got me thinking, OK, how do I how do I do good in other ways? And so. Um, being an engineer by training, I was I was always a, a tinker of sorts. Like growing up, you know, Legos were my jam. I used to like make these crazy things with Legos. I loved like creating things. And so um, I got into the engineering side and quickly found out like how powerful engineering can be in healthcare and how, uh, you know, you can almost do a, a mass, a more, a, a, I guess, good on a different scale. So if you're a doctor and you're seeing patients every day, you might see, I don't know what the numbers are, but maybe 30 or 40 patients a day, maybe a hundred a week. But um, if you, if you see five, I guess that'd be about 5,000 patients a year um, over the course of your career, you can, you can reach out to quite a, quite a few people, but if you can dedicate your efforts in something like a cure or something, I mean, you're not only helping people for your lifetime, but you're helping people for many, many lifetimes to come because all of the information that you gather in research is incremental. And that's what really drew me to it is that the world only knows so much right now. So if you imagine that the amount of information we know is contained in like a, a bubble, let's say, like a sphere. And all of that information is finite, right? There's only so much in there. But over time, people are learning more and more things. So that sphere is growing. So I'm imagining myself on the edge of that sphere, just kind of poking out that sphere ever so slightly, filling the world with just a little bit more knowledge. So I think I think for me, that's really rewarding. And, and just to think that, you know, I am working towards uh, ultimately, I was working on therapeutic, uh, or sorry, diagnostic measures for various diseases, which is very important in its own right to detect disease early. But uh, the work I do now has implications in diagnostics, but also in therapeutics, which is kind of where I, where I see myself going in, in, in my career. So there's my mom that kind of got me into the healthcare industry. Um, and then I also had quite a few family members like Kiyami was saying, she has some family members that had to go on the dialysis machines a lot. But um, it seemed like amongst my friends, I, I had uh, a lot of family members and other friends uh, be affected by cancer, whether they, the cancer took their lives early or they just had to go in and out of the hospital for cancer purposes. So I knew that I wanted to dedicate my my career in, in helping those with, with cancer. So um, that's kind of where I kind of find my niche at now is I, I've, I've done a lot of research, but it all 
if you look at the the global trend of my career, it's it's focused on cancer. So I think that's that's just the path for me. And as Kiami said, like that's that's what I wake up happy to do with my life. And then I don't even think it's a job anymore because I really enjoy doing it. Yeah, that's great. So what about the second part of the question here? Um, research. Why is it important for students to learn how to do um, to do research effectively? Oh, yeah. So I totally forgot about the second part. So, yeah. So I kind of a little bit alluded to it in terms of we're building on the world's knowledge of 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 everything. Right. And then you you focus on a particular topic. And that's what's really cool is you really take a deep dive into the very tiny little details of this particular topic. Uh, for, for, mine, for, for me right now, it's, it's uh, medulloblastoma, so pediatric brain cancer. And so you take a really deep dive into what the world already knows so that you can become a master on that particular topic and that then you can push the world's sphere of knowledge, so to speak, using that analogy again, on that particular topic and to do research effectively is you want to make sure that your discoveries or what you're you're analyzing, the numbers that you're quantifying, everything that you're doing in the lab um, has to be sound and solid. And so that requires a lot of repetition, of course. Um, you know, the hot topic right now is, of course, the, the coronavirus and the research endeavor that's going on in terms of, you know, c- coming up with a vaccine, for instance. Let's use that anal- analogy where... You know, the, the healthcare officials and the researchers are trying their hardest to get that, that vaccine to the public as quickly as possible. Um, but with that quickness, sometimes comes uh, cutting corners. And that's a huge no-no. You have to go through all the right steps to make sure that what you're seeing is indeed a fact, a, a proven scientific fact with, with statistical significance that you're a making sure that that vaccine is effective, but also that it's safe, that you're not, you're not infecting, you're not having people, normal, healthy people take something or have a shot of something that could ultimately do more harm than good. So there's, there's just so much, so much importance that's behind the scenes in, in the research world that many people don't, don't really appreciate. So um, that's just kind of some of my passions, I guess, for that. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, I think that's exactly what we were looking for. Uh, I mean, again, I, I remember having to take a research class in college and thinking like, why, why will, why do I need to do this? I'll never use it. Um, and it turns out it's a really, really good tool to have in your <laughs> toolbox. Um, David, let me move over to you a little bit. Um, yeah. Obviously, when we're talking about the healthcare field and industry, uh-huh. um, you know, there are certain skills that you have to have, right? If you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a nurse, if you're going... Right. Um, to be an OT or, or or whatever it might be, you know, you have to know some of those things. But what we hear from a lot of employers are um, around the soft skills, teamwork, um, collaboration, mm-hmm. problem solving. We had someone in um, our on dem- our in demand career fields webinar talked um, from Nissan talked about how problem solving is um, maybe the most important thing you'll do in your career. Um, why is that important? Is that something that um, is really important for you at Murray Regional? Uh, is it something you see students are lacking? What can students do to get those skills now? Well, you know, one of the things that we're talking about is that so, you know, all the there are tons of different soft skills. So defining the soft skills is one thing, um, because when you're looking at hardcore knowledge, actual knowledge that can be taught uh, and you can learn that that's why you're in class that's why you pay attention in classes so you get the foundational hardcore knowledge but what you don't get in that environment is how do you communicate that knowledge to someone else in a meaningful way um, you know how can I make sure that the message that um, I'm trying to convey is the message that's being received uh, so you know, when you look at that, you're looking at that's problem solving there as well. Um, you know, like you can hear uh, you can hear someone explain something like Kirby could probably give us a great uh, um, uh, a speech on, you know, all the stuff that's involved. And, and Kiami could give us a good talk on all the stuff that goes on in the back. But how do we know it's connecting with someone? It's kind of like that telephone game we played as kids, you know, what you're saying versus what actually gets all the way around the room. So 
I, one of the things I find in healthcare, especially, is that the other person has to understand what you're saying and what you expect from them to do. You know, what is it? What does you expect? I mean, all the people that I've known that have been extremely successful in healthcare. Number one, they know how to ask good questions. And number two, they know how to listen and then be able to clarify, make sure they get everything down there together. Um, and they're not the ones doing all the talking. You know, I, I, can, I, I, mean, I just think of a, a research study that was done at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center up at Harvard that showed where physicians talk 80 percent of the time during one on one with a with a uh, patient. Well, that they've had to change that dynamic because they find that the best physicians actually listen 80% of the time. And so, you know, things like that, the, you know, those are the things, but you've also got to know what your skill set is and what your passions are. You know, I was listening to Kiami and, and listening to her where uh, she was going down one path and then it's like this light bulb, probably an experience that she had or a conglomeration of experiences that led her to sit, sit there and say, no, no, not that. This is what I want to do. And so it's being able that emotional intelligence is what we call that. And it's having a high level of that, that I think that that's the soft skills that we really need to focus on. And that's one of the things we look for is, um, you know, we look for when we're interviewing candidates to work here at Murray, we look for what are their question skills and what are their listening skills like during that whole interview process. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit about your um, job search and as you're entering the workforce, recent college graduate, um, some of those things that David was just talking about. What did you learn um, interviewing for jobs and while you were looking for jobs? What advice do you have for college students that may be graduating here in six weeks or so? Um, I would definitely say for me, because after I graduated, I was kind of in that crossroads of going back to education or like trying to find something else. Cause I was like, I know I just didn't spend the last two years of my life doing education. Now I done got to the end. Now I want to do something else. Um, I would definitely just say, be on your P's and Q's, come prepared because a lot of people, they, some people lack social skills. So they kind of aren't, when it comes to interviews, they let the interviews get the best of them. But I would just definitely say, have the utmost confidence in yourself because so many people, they get intimidated when they get to the interviews and it's like three or four people, they're asking them questions and then they like, they freeze up a bit. For me, I had to do my research on the position first and foremost when I started at DaVita. I was like, okay, you have to come prepared. Don't sit there and think they're going to ask you just the regular questions. Be prepared for anything for sure. Um, just having an open mind and being prepared to ask them questions as well. Cause I feel like people out of younger people that's coming straight out of high school, they kind of skip over the part of interviewing the person that's interviewing them as well. They kind of like, okay, do I have the job or focused on how much the position may pay It's certain things that people are, they focus on the most. And that's one of the things that's like a red flag for employers. Like, don't jump right in like, OK, so when do I start? Kind of dial back a little bit, do your research or wherever you decide to uh, interview with. Make sure that you know the company versus, well, I've seen a commercial, but like do your research on it. That's really <laughs> for sure. You yeah, know, Kiyami, I mean, I think it's, yeah, you, ahead, uh, yeah, yeah. Kiami, you know, you brought up a really good point. And, and it's something that I, I try to teach uh, folks that are going out and interviewing now is that you're, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Absolutely. So, and it's and it's picking good questions. I can't tell you how many times you sit in an interview and say, so so now how much paid time off do I get? Right. And that kind of stuff. You know, no, instead ask questions about because remember, you're going to be working for that person. Now's the time for you to ask questions like, so what does success look like in your mind for this position? Absolutely. What does in that way, you know, can I meet that expectation? Because if you can, then, yeah, I got a better chance of being happier in this position. Otherwise, you know, you know, the, and, and then ask about the position, you know, 
what what's the most difficult part of this job? Asking questions like that so you see that you're a good fit. Because the number one reason people leave a position is is their first their their direct manager. The number two reason people leave is because the job wasn't what they thought it would be. And right. that's what the interview process. I mean, Kiami, I'm sure you love it when people when you're interviewing people and they ask you, so tell me what's the hardest part of this job? What's a real day like? And then what's an unreal day like in this job? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really good advice for our students. You know, we've got a group of students that are going to graduate here in about six weeks or so. Kirby, I'm going to ask you something a little bit different, but related to, I think, choosing your career. Um, You know, we hear a lot from this current generation, this next generation, that they want to have careers that are impactful and meaningful. And I think you go into healthcare probably because of that. But then on top of it, you're working for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. That's, um, you know, this massive nonprofit that pretty much everyone, everyone on earth has heard of that people are, every organization in the world does fundraisers for and has this incredible brand and this incredible name. So what is it like to work for a nonprofit in a field like that, where not only are you helping people in the healthcare side with your patients, um, but in this nonprofit way, that's a little bit unique to most other healthcare providers. Oh man, I think you hit the nail on the head for St. Jude in terms of, uh, I mean, I think for one, it's just like the the culture that that St. Jude has there. I mean, it being a non for profit and its missions being completely and ultimately focused on helping children and um, and like their mission statement is you know completely you know built structured around the patients that the pediatric catastrophic diseases that it helps um, tackle there is, I mean, that's a passion that's infectious across the entire um, employee base. I mean, you just walk through the halls there and everyone's smiling, everybody's everyone's happy and in it together and friendly. And it's just, nobody's there to be all about the bottom line and their profit margins because ultimately it's just all, all about helping the children. It's not about, you know, making the most money for the corporate shareholders <laughs> or something like that, right? So having... Having that be the focus and the mission there really gets people to wake up, uh, you know, out of, get out of bed every day to help kids. And yes, like there's patients everywhere around you reminding you of the reason why you're doing that work. So if if any times I'm in any time I'm in the cubicle, kind of in a rut where I just don't really feel motivated, all I do is walk down to the K Cafe. It's where it's where everybody eats together. Like everybody in the entire hospital eats at this one cafe, and so. You you eat and dine and you sit with with you know patients and patients family and you're reminded immediately why you're why you're there why you do the work that you do because it's it's so impactful and so meaningful and that's that's really uh, contagious and and I and I just love it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I can't imagine that. Um, I mean, you have to know that going to work every day that you're making a difference in, in what all of you are doing, um, but certainly at St. Jude. David, talk to us a little bit. Um, Murray Regional has been a really good partner for Tennessee Achieves and for Tennessee Promise students. You're always providing job shadowing opportunities. Um, and I know that the hospital is very involved in the community. Why is that important? Why is it um, important to be a good social member um, as a, a large healthcare system? Well, our case is a little unique in that we're not owned by a corporation. We're actually owned by the citizens of our seven county region, Murray region, Murray County and the, the, the counties we own, they own us. So we answering, when we talk about answering to our shareholders, we're answering to our, to our neighbors, to the people next to us, because they're actually the ones that keep us in business. I mean, uh, and I think that's one of the things that makes us very unique uh, as opposed to a lot of other uh, hospital systems is that, that fact that we haven't been swallowed up by a big conglomerate. And so it is about patient focus. I mean, our mission here, I mean, we, one of the things that that I preach in a lot of our classes is that, you know, you have, if you want to work here, you have to embody the mission of the organization, which is, you know, and our, our mission starts out with to serve, to serve the people of our region, you know, with clinical excellence and compassionate 
care. And so we keep that at the forefront. Uh, one of the things we try to stress is that every activity we do, you need to be able to say, how is that serving? How is it excellent? And how is it compassionate? And I think that makes us unique because we we do keep the patients, their families, and everybody associated with them. And we can define that as being if we've got a Murray County resident who's in our hospital and they have a family member in California. Well, our region has suddenly gone out of here to California because we're interacting on the phone and giving updates on that loved one here. And I think that's the impact that it makes. I mean, it's it's it takes a unique person to work in healthcare. Um, but you all do it for different reasons. I mean, I know, I know anesthesiologists, uh, I've just interviewed a couple recently and they both had very different reasons for loving what they did. But the key is, is they knew they loved, they knew what it was they loved. And if I had to give any counsel to any of the students right now, and when, when I talk to them, when they come down here and do the job shadow, I say, ask people around here, what it is about their job that they love, because if you love it, then you're going to be happier in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Kiami kind of touched on that earlier, too, talking about yeah. if you love what you do, it doesn't feel like you're going to work every day. Exactly. Um, Kiami, uh, well, I think one thing that you all left out of your um, introductions here is all three of you service Tennessee Achieves mentors. Um, mm -hmm. I did some uh, quick pull of all of your accounts because we have we have nine years of experience as Tennessee Achieves mentors on the panel. So we want to thank you guys all for that. But um, Kiami, as a Tennessee Promise student, you were required to do community service hours just like students are now. Um, but you have obviously continued to run with that, um, serving and volunteering as a mentor. Why do you think it's important to give back? Um, for me personally, growing up in Detroit, I knew I wouldn't have this type of opportunity presented in front of me. So when I heard about it my senior year, like me and a couple of my friends, they were like, oh, no, I don't think I'm going to do it. So I was like the only one that took advantage of this opportunity. And just to have this opportunity open so many other doors for me, it was the least that I could do on my behalf to just show my gratitude. Because I don't know what, what I'd be doing where I'd be without this program overall. Like aside from being a mentor right now, just being in a position to go out in the community and help others, that's was that always made me smile that's what kept me going because you don't know what people deal with every day and to be at the soup kitchens helping somebody get a meal for the day and just seeing them smile I was like okay I gotta find out how to be a part of this program overall because it's like so many kids don't understand how privileged they are and when they get the opportunity to go back into the community and see people that's like less fortunate in a sense, it humbles them, but it also motivates them like, okay, I got to keep going because you don't, you complain about like the little stuff, but then it's like when you're in the field, helping the community and you see different things, it kind of inspires you like, okay, this is, this is inspiring. And for me, myself, I just, um, I just had to find a way to help somebody else because I needed somebody like me growing up. So it was like, I had to dedicate that time back because you guys gave me the opportunity and dedicate, dedicated so much time in me. I was like, okay, now I have to duplicate that back. Well, I think we're done here. I don't know if you guys want to try to follow up with that, um, but that <laughs> what a, um, a great answer, I think, to why it is so important. Um, to getting back, I, I think we can all probably, and David and Kirby, you guys feel free to pipe in here, but I think we all probably um, can can look back to someone that invested some time in us and and got helped to get us where we are today. That we probably didn't do this on our own. Um, and I think what a great outlook um, that you have about why it's important to get back to your community. Yeah, and I think I think that we all have people that, if you think about it, we all have people in our lives who affected our trajectory into our future, uh, whether it was inspiration or a mentor. Um, and the best ones are mentors um, who are there to just kind of help guide you and not tell you what to do, but guide you with the right questions to kind of say, you know, so why, why is it you're looking to do this? What is it you're looking to do? And that kind of thing, just to kind of challenge your thought process. And that's one of the things I love to do. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think yeah, Johnny, we'll add on. I would definitely. Go ahead, Kirby. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to add that. I mean, what Kiami and David said is absolutely perfect. I, I, I definitely agree that having some sort of mentorship mentor for an individual is extremely beneficial. And, and being a mentor has been an amazing experience for me the last two and a half years has been extremely rewarding. And I think, I think um, it's really, I don't know, it sounds kind of selfish, but I mean, I, I love helping the individual, the individuals that I, that I help, but it's definitely a rewarding experience for me. And it's almost like a endorphin really releasing experience when you help somebody, uh, especially when you do community service, it, you know, yeah, you help the community, but you'll find once you get out there and, and doing it, it's really, really rewarding. And it just makes you just really feel great when you do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's one of the foundations of Tennessee Achieves is our students are giving back. We have this 9,000 person volunteer mentor program. And I think it's really important. And Kiami, I'll add to your sentiment that, you know, we here at Tennessee Achieves are, are really proud of you and the work that you're doing as, as one of our graduates out in the world these days. Um, I'll ask all of you guys this next question and uh, we can go in the order we've been going in. I guess, David, you can go first. But um, for our students that are interested in going into a healthcare field, um, what advice do you have for them? What can they be doing now to, pre to prepare? Uh, and then I'll also ask you, and you don't have to go real in depth, but kind of what career opportunities are available for students, um, maybe with an associate's degree versus a bachelor's degree, you know, working your way on up and kind of what does it look like um, salary wise as they um, continue to get more education? Okay, well, um, so just to kind of bite off a little bit at each time of what you asked there, uh, I would say pay close attention to those activities that you're doing where you just lose all track of time uh, because that's that's where your strengths are. Uh, you're just naturally attracted to that. But then take it to a step deeper and ask what it is about that. I mean, if you're helping, if you if you get lost helping somebody in time and you look up at the clock, it's been an hour and it feels like 15 minutes, you need to step back and say, what was it about that that I really loved? Because that's going to help you as you maneuver your way through the various opportunities through healthcare, because different thing, different parts of different avenues of healthcare offer different things like that. If you like, if you get lost in the analytics of stuff and, and looking at numbers and looking at patterns of data, there's a place for you in healthcare. If you love serving others, there's a place for you in healthcare. So when it comes to different positions um, with associate's degrees, there's nurse positions, there's nurse tech positions, there's occupational therapy technicians, um, and the salary bands for those, um, they're, they're pretty wide, uh, but it gives you, I mean, I've, I'm working right now, one of, the, one of the people I'm mentoring here at the hospital, she started out with an associate's degree as a nurse tech. She has, through her, through her experience, she's worked her way up. She went on, took advantage of some of the programs we have here for tuition reimbursement, got her bachelor's degree. She's now heading up our emergency department. And so she's done that in a matter of about five or six years. And of course, her salary has gone way up with that, too. You know, when you're looking at nurse tech, you're looking at an hourly rate. When you're looking at the manager of a department, you're looking at at, uh, at quite a bit of a salary jump. So it really, to kind of pinpoint it down, uh, nurse the nurse techs can be in the 30s and 40,000s and sometimes as high as 50,000, depending upon the area of specialty that you're in. So you want to research that. And that's the kinds of things to ask, you know, when, when folks are doing their uh, job shadowing, I ask them, you know, Ask the people you're shadowing, you know, what's the salary range like in here? Get those kinds of questions out there and find out and see what it is that you love to do and see if you can pair that with a uh, with the right salary amount that you're looking for. Yeah. And Kiami, what have you seen? Uh, again, recently looking for jobs, what kind of opportunities are out there for students that are interested in a uh, career in healthcare. Um, just to go off David, he kind of like my thought process, me and him were thinking the same thing because that was my go to like the nurse text for sure, because I work with some that's going back for their associates because they only have a high school diploma right now and they're kind of wanting to do more within their salary range. So just like the phlebotomy 
it's a um it's a program. It's actually a program with that. Um it's another one and I can't even think of it. But they go hand in hand. Um definitely just uh I can't think of that title, but it's another uh, title that we have and they go hand in hand. It's just different programs, regardless if it's a eight week program, six week program, associates, masters, PhD, whichever. It's like so many different things. And I think people just get so focused on what they hear every day, like a doctor or a LPN or RN. But it's so like the horizon is so many opportunities out here. It's just what the what's the time period you want to dedicate to it? If you only want to go to school two years, it's opportunities there. If you want to go the full four years, it's just so many different things that people just have to research. Like, what do you like to do? It's it's something in healthcare for it. Just to go off what David said, because I agree with him completely on that. So it's just really the time period of what you want to dedicate. Like, if you want to go two, if you want to go four years, it's just all different options for sure. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different opportunities in healthcare. Kirby, what about at St. Jude? What type of opportunities are available for students as they're graduating and um, maybe based on education? Any, if you have any insight into maybe salary for different levels of education? Yeah, uh, I have a little bit of insight, not a whole lot. Um, but yeah, for, for instance, um, as a student, there's a lot of great like internship programs or even um, even if you want to do some volunteer work in a research lab, I think there's avenues to, to do that. I would, I would encourage doing that because it's just great experience. Even if you have an a inkling of, of doing research, um, even just a taste of it will give you a good sense of if it's right for you or not. Um, but with the job, it's, it's really amazing because of your flexibility and your kind of independence in terms of um, your work independence. You don't have someone breathing over your shoulder all the time. Like you kind of work for yourself. And, and um, with that comes challenges, of course, because you got to stay on task. But um, like, for instance, um, for me, having a PhD um, is kind of an interesting situation because once you, once you get um, into a PhD program, uh, what's amazing about that is um, depending on if there's funding or not for your program, which a lot of PhDs in, in biomedical research do, do have funding, but um, I didn't have to go into any debt because my my PhD was actually paid through a stipend, a research stipend. When you're doing research, it's sort of like a job. Like you, you come to work, you're pretty much at work eight to five, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on if you have deadlines or stuff or grants going on or what. But um, what's really amazing about that is um, rather than going into med school and potentially going into a lot of debt, if they're trying to be a doctor, I know that, you know, the med school fees um, could be really, really, um, I don't know, it could basically bury you in debt. But the great thing is I got this degree and, and um, they paid me for it. So uh, it wasn't much. I wasn't able to really go crazy with my salary, as, you know, as a PhD student, but it was enough to get by. And, um, and that was really amazing. But once you have that, then typically you'll go straight into a research position, a research scientist position, or if you have um, aspiring uh, direction to go maybe become like a research faculty at like a research institute, then a lot of times you'll do like a postdoctoral fellowship. And it's sort of similar to what you, you'd experience from a doctor, like a medical doctor's perspective, where you uh, essentially are doing more training. So a fellowship as an MD is, you know, typically, Typically, if you're doing a specialty, you'll spend three or, or four more years um, to really master your, maybe you're a general surgeon and you want to master that field. Um, it's the same sort of thing where, and right now I'm, I'm actually doing a postdoctoral um, postdoctoral fellowship where I'm, I'm doing more training. Um, the pay isn't quite as much as what you'd get as a research scientist, like a full-time research scientist. Um, but with a little bit less pay, I'm getting so much in in training aspects. So um, it's sort of an investment in, in that regard. But um, so like right now as a postdoctoral fellow, um, I make more than fifty thousand. So somewhere in the fifty to fifty five thousand dollars a year salary range. Um, you get a little bit more every year. But if you get a research scientist position with a PhD, you're typically on the order of uh, seventy, eighty. Sometimes 90, if, uh, you know, it goes up the amount of years of experience you have. Um, even if you just get a master's, 
or even if you're a lab tech, let's say you're an undergrad and you go straight into research as a, as a lab technician, um, you can make easily 60 or 70,000. And then with a master's, you can make a little bit more. So there's definitely um, avenues that you make a really nice, uh, comfortable living and you have the flexibility and um, just joy of, of doing good for the world that that comes with it. So it's, it's definitely uh, a good place to be. Yeah, definitely. No, I appreciate all your guys' insight into that. Um, and so I appreciate all of your insight um, as we're talking about careers in healthcare. But what we like to do, we've got about um, 10 minutes or so left, so maybe we'll go a little kind of rapid fire on these. But we like to finish the webinar with three questions for everyone. Um, so, David, we'll start with you, um, and everyone can answer this question. But, David, um, what is one thing you know now that you didn't know when you were in college that you wish that you knew? Oh, uh, <laughs> I wish I'd known how to organize myself a little, little better, because um, at that time in college, I was working 40 hours a week uh, with sports teams and traveling and all that. And it really wasn't until my second year that I realized how I need to come up with a way to better organize myself so I could keep my grades going. Perfect. I think that's a good answer. I know organization is something a lot of our students, um, organization and time management. But Kiami, what about you? What is something you know that you wish you knew while you were in college? Um, I would definitely have to say time management because I'm one of those. I like to multitask and do everything like do try to knock out so much. But it's like even going from high school to college, I was so used to my teachers, my high school teachers like, OK, we'll give you another week to get this turned in. And it's like when I got to college, it was like, you better turn that in now. It's no <laughs> extension. So just having that reality check like, OK, they're not playing because you're so used to being in <laughs> exemptions and stuff like that. So definitely time management and deadlines. Yeah, uh, that's a big one for students. Kirby, what about you? Yeah, just to add on that, because I agree that time management and the organization uh, planning, goal setting, uh, some of those skills I really didn't develop until recently. And it's really, really helped me out. And and kind of to build on that even is um, to, to get into a routine, like basically that kind of all that kind of might help with a lot of these things. If you can put yourself into a routine where you say, okay, from this hour to this hour, every day, I'm going to do this. Then that kind of holds yourself more accountable and, and it allows you to, to be a little bit more productive in that sense. Yeah. I think that is um, a really strong advice for students there. So we're going to kind of move into a similar kind of question. Um, Kiami, we'll start with you this time. If you have one piece of advice for students, what would it be? The one most important piece of advice. <laughs> Um, I would have to say it's normal to get discouraged from time to time, but if something in life was promised to be easy, everybody would do it, but just keep pushing. It's going to be some hard days. It's going to be some good days, but regardless, just keep pushing and don't let it defeat you. Don't give up. It's worth it in the end, right? Yep, absolutely. Kirby, what about you? <laughs> yeah, I took the words right out of my mouth, but yeah, persistence is omnipotent, right? There's so many people that that really that might be gifted and talented, but if you don't stay at it and, and be determined and and like you said, Graham, like don't give up. Uh, there's lots of people that are super talented that 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 fail. So even even those that might be not as as talented, if you are persistent, that alone can be could be you know can lead to huge huge success. So yeah. That. And I think it's one of the things we hear from employers is that don't give up attitude, that hard work ethic is so, um, or strong work ethic is so important. David, what's your one piece of advice? Well, my thing is to find out what you love. I mean, because we've got this, uh, we've got this mantra that's a false mantra out there of a work-life balance. And there actually is no such thing as work-life balance, because if there was, you'd have to find that moment and the world would have to stop and say, don't anybody move. I got work-life balance right now. You've only got one life. So work is a part of life. Find out what you love to do and make that part of your life. I think that's great advice. So our final question, I uh, always think is a really fun question. Um, Kirby, we'll kick it off with you this time. Um, if you could do anything besides your respective careers um, in the healthcare industry, but you could do anything, talent doesn't matter, money doesn't matter, time doesn't matter. You could do anything in the world besides what you're doing right now. What would you do? <laughs> a good clause in that was besides what I do, because I definitely love what I do. But, um, you know, there's for me, 
I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie and there's no better thing in the world than flying down a mountain snowboarding. So I'd probably <laughs> even, I'd probably snowboard, but um, be a professional snowboarder. But I guess for less uh, risk, I might be a professional golfer, maybe. I really like golfing. <laughs> so something outside. <laughs> That professional golfing one is mine too. I don't have the I don't have the ability or talent to do that, but I like that one. David, what about you? What what would you be doing outside of the healthcare? Field? Oh, I would I would as well. My, except I would I would live at the beach near a golf course and play as much as I could, and then I'd still still have to consult a little bit and and work with uh work with them, some folks in what I'm doing right now. I mean, I got to pay for my green fees one way. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They're not paying us to play. It doesn't look no, like. exactly. <laughs> All right, Kiami, finish us strong. If you could be doing anything besides what you're doing right now, what would you be doing? Um, For me, I would have to say traveling. I'm such a sightseeing person. I love to just like travel and see different things. You have any trips on the books? I did, but you know, <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird time. And I, I know that this <laughs> is, um, uh, for all of you in the healthcare industry right now, I know that this is um, a crazy time and it's probably um, really busy for you. And it's it's uh, probably um, forcing you to, to think creatively and outside the box. And so we appreciate the time that you have taken with us today. I can't thank you enough for serving in your role as a mentor um, and making the time for us today as you continue to go out of your way to help make sure that Tennessee Promise students are successful. We really appreciate your time today and thank you guys for being here. Thank you. For okay. our uh, participants, for our audience today, um, I know that uh, someone with a communication background with very limited knowledge of healthcare, I just learned a ton. Um, so I hope that our audience today learned a lot of things. For those of you that are interested in careers in healthcare, um, this was a really, really great panel. I had a lot of fun participating. So I want to thank our panelists again. For those of you in our audience, our students, please um, stay on for just another second. There's going to be some information on how this will count for you as um, a part of your community service requirement. Thanks for tuning in today, and we hope that you will join us for another in our series on our virtual community service at www.tnachieves.org. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for watching this installment of the Tennessee Achieves Virtual Community Service Webinar. Your attendance will be automatically recorded and your one hour of community service is being credited to you. Please click submit on this screen to ensure that your attendance is recorded for you. For this community service opportunity, you will not need to complete the community service form. We hope you found this opportunity to be engaging and informative. Please watch more of this series by visiting www.tnachieves.org. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.